My name is Ben Fitzsimmons. I am the Associate Director of Programs and Research at the Autry Museum at the American West, and I'd like to welcome you all today. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Autry is on the ancestral lands of the Tongva Gabrielino and recognize them, along with their neighbors, the Tataviam and Chumash, as the traditional caretakers of this land. Today's program features the Pulitzer Prize winning historian Elizabeth Fenn as she discusses her book, Pox Americana, The Great Smallpox Epidemic of 1775 to 82, and how the story of one of the most devastating epidemics in American history may provide lessons for our time. She'll be in conversation with Virginia Scharf, Autry Senior Scholar and Distinguished Professor of History Emerita at the University of New Mexico. Virginia Scharf specializes in the histories of women and of the American West, and her many publications include Taking the Wheel, Women in the Coming to Motor Age, 20,000 Roads, Women, Movement, and the West, The Women Jefferson Loved, and Homelands, How Women Made the West. She was co-curator of the exhibition of the same name here at the Autry, as well as our hugely successful 2015 exhibition, Empire and Liberty, the Civil War and the West. I'm always thrilled when Ginger is available to help us with these programs. This is, wee, this is always fun. Our, our guest today, Elizabeth Fenn, teaches history at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her book, Pox Americana, The Great Smallpox Epidemic of 1775 to 82, examines a terrible smallpox epidemic that swept North America in the years of the American Revolution. And is also the author of Encounters at the Heart of the World, A History of the Mandan People, which conveys early American history from the perspective of indigenous peoples at the center of the continent. Both books are currently available for purchase at the Autry store online. That is shop.theautry.org. I'll write that in the chat later. And if you don't already own a copy, please go on and uh, purchase one of those books. Ben is currently working on an expansive biography of Sacagawea that uses her life story to illuminate a wider history of the Northern Plains and the Rockies. And as a result of that book, we, the Autry has awarded the Butcher Scholar Prize. And we hope to hear from Professor Fenn later, next, sometime next year, a little more about the research behind that project. And now, enough from me. I'll hand it over to the presenters for today. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, I'm Virginia Scharf in this box, and that's Elizabeth Fenn in the other box. Uh, we are going to be referring to each each other uh, by our well-known nicknames of I'm Gingy and she's Lil. So if you hear us calling each other that, that's who we are going to be. Um, but I think that kind of informality in some ways belies the seriousness and the absolute uh, remarkableness of the research project that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, Dr. Fenn's book, Pox Americana, which is a story of a devastating smallpox epidemic uh, that raged through the North American continent in this period of the late 18th century. And I, I guess I just want to start out, Lil, by asking you that, you know, really what story were you trying to, to tell in, in Pox America? So on the face of it, I wanted to convey a narrative about this smallpox epidemic that swept North America during almost exactly the years of the American Revolution. You know, smallpox is a disease that we've put out of mind. Uh, it's the only human infection that we have knowingly and deliberately eradicated from the planet. But in the 1700s, it was what uh, the British historian T.B. Macaulay called the most terrible of ministers of yeah, um, and what, I'm gonna sh share my screen briefly. I don't wanna freak people out by leaving the screen up too long, but I want you to, the, the screen I'm gonna share will, will explain why it was considered the most terrible of ministers of death. Um, this was really a, a, a horrific um, illness with a 38% with a case fatality rate uh, that surely humbles coronavirus today. At any rate, the epidemic intervened in the Revolutionary War. It uh, 
dash the aspirations of freedom loving um, African Americans. I'm going to share another screen. There you go. So you can see as I'm, I'm as I'm speaking, it uh, it undercut native sovereignty east of the Mississippi River. It coursed through the the cities and missions of Mexico, New Mexico, California. It remade power dynamics on the Great Plains, and it disrupted the Canadian fur trade. So that was the overarching narrative that I wanted to tell. Just, you know, I'm going to say the scale of this epidemic or the multiple epidemics that we were looking at absolutely blew my mind. And also the ways in which it altered the course of events that we think we already know about. And I mean, that's such a powerful part of the story that you're telling there. It did. It altered the course of the American Revolution from the very beginning, from Lexington and Concord onward, from uh, the episodes in Virginia where African Americans tried to claim their own freedom and allied themselves with the, the British during the war. You know, it intervened again and again. There were accusations of germ warfare. But the Atlantic coast was just part of the story. Uh, and, and that kind of uh, gets to the, my, my hidden agenda in this book, which was to nudge my field a little bit. You know, early American history is pretty Anglo-centric and Native peoples, um, the West, tend not to appear in the American historical canon it's changed, I should say, you know, they used to not appear in the American historical canon until Anglo-Americans encountered them. Um, so what I was wanted to do was incorporate these peoples and places from the, you know, as, as early as possible and show how interconnected everything was across the continent by this time. But that's a really hard thing for you to do. I mean, to be able to show how interconnected everything was, you had to go everywhere to find those connections. And what was stunning to me is the amount of research and the numbers of places and different kinds of sources that you had to use. And so, you know, this to me, Fox Americana is a stunning work of, uh, of historical detective um, skills. And so could you talk a little bit about, uh, about the kind of places and sources and the detective work of being a historian? Yeah, you know, research, researching this book was probably the funnest thing I have ever done uh, because it, I, I just felt like I was sleuthing. I was going through everything I could put my hands on generated during a particular time period in order to see if I could find smallpox. I can't tell you how many times I was fooled going through material quickly when I stumbled over the words small box. You know, I've sent you a small box of what, <laughs> what? Oh, that's not it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the, the sources I ended up using, I, obviously, you know, the Atlantic seaboard was easy, uh, or comparatively easy, because there are so many published materials for the, for the Revolutionary War, for uh, Thomas Jefferson or John and Abigail Adams, um, even for African American history in South Carolina, Virginia, North Carolina. Um, so the Atlantic seaboard was, was really pretty easy to handle. It got trickier in the West uh, because we have very few firsthand eyewitnesses account you know, on the scene um, to record things. So I ended up using the accounts that we have, but also trying to find native voices where I could. Um, and how did you do that? I mean, where, what kind of documents were you using to be able to find those voices? And I know you had to be able to, for example, use Spanish documents. Um, so, you know, you're already having to deal with a couple different languages, but you're also looking for people for whom the, those two, English and Spanish, are never going to be their first language. So how do you how do you find those voices? Yeah, that that's very true. And I'm not my Spanish is not that good, uh, but it's not that hard to find smallpox in the records either. Um, 
Native voices were hard to find. I mean, you know, if somebody were to write an update of this book, I'd love for it to be a Native person to write a Native version of the story from a Native perspective. Um, so that what I ended up using primarily was Indigenous oral traditions that has been written down. I tended to, uh, I used a lot of Hudson Bay Company materials and those traders put Native Americans front and center in their writings. And sometimes you could extract uh, Native voices from that. The other wonderful Native source is something called a winter count. Uh, let me share a screen. So I, if, I don't know how many of the, the people um, who've signed in have are familiar with winter counts, but a winter count is basically a, a Native American historical record. Uh, many bands, especially on the plains, had uh, self-proclaimed winter count keepers in the band, and they would record the passage of every winter with a pictograph representing a significant event. Uh, so and this traditionally would be recorded on a bison hide, sometimes on a teepee, sometimes on canvas, as you can see here on ledger paper. This is a Sikangu Lakota. Winter Count, Baptiste Hood, he was also called Brown Hat. Um, and smallpox appears in Winter Count. Uh, this, this is also Baptiste Hood's Winter Count. And here you see the smallpox epidemic addressed in the book uh, appearing twice, back to back. Sometimes the years don't line up exactly because Native peoples are recording a winter, not a calendar year as Western people do. Um, but Winter Counts uh, are fabulous for tracing epidemic disease. Those images are so powerful, and particularly the one you just showed with the, you know, the pockmarked bodies. And I think about the fact that, you know, here we are, everybody who's joined us, we're all living through this pandemic. It is, uh, you know, an emotional experience that we're all sharing from our isolated boxes and, and, and our special, you know, sheltered places that, to the extent that we are able to, to shelter in place. And, and so, I, you know, this really affects how we're thinking about the past and the present. And I, I guess I just want to ask, you know, I, as I read your book, I was so um, emotionally drawn in by the devastation yeah. that people encountered. And I really wonder, how did you deal with the emotional toll of researching and writing this book? You said you were you were looking for, for smallpox everywhere. And, and then when you find it, what is that like? Yeah, it's terrifying. Um, but it was also somehow inspiring, probably because of that reframing enterprise that I described at, at the beginning. You know, I felt like I was reclaiming soul for American history. People who'd been missed, people who'd been forgotten, people you know, and events that they experienced that um, we've forgotten about. You know, I felt like I was reclaiming, you know, their suffering, their courage, their cowardice and something, you know, um, their endurance, their persistence. So it almost became, a, that was like the missionary work for me in doing the research that, that kept me rolling. But it was hard, hard too. Um, I spent months going through Spanish records, especially the, the records of the, the Catholic Church. I'll, I'll share a screen again to show you what those records were like. So the mission records of the, this, the, the Catholic Church um, included these books called Libros de Entierros, which were burial records. And they were the moves, most moving documents I dealt with, even though they just consisted of lists of names, be a name, gender, sometimes an age, and a date of death. On occasion, they'd indicate the cause of death. But there was a point when, uh, when I was just literally moved to tears going through these, these lists of names. It's kind of like visiting the Vietnam Memorial, yeah. if you've ever done that, you know? Yeah. Um, just makes you think about these the thousands of textured rich lives that were lost. Yeah, I mean, I think about, I went to an absolutely moving exhibition about the Holocaust in um, 
Mexico and New Mexico at the New Mexico History Museum. Oh. And they, I mean, they had similar kinds of Spanish uh, burial records. And I mean, they, during the Inquisition, they dug them up to see if somebody was a, was a Jew and then put them back down again oh. to record them. And then they just put those names on the wall. And it was so powerful to me. So for you to be, you know, finding these things for the, for the first time and connecting all of these different uh, stories about uh, this terrible contagion that had so many devastating effects in so many different places. Um, you know, obviously all kinds of, of social and, and geographical and technological and political factors influence the spread of smallpox. So, um, you know, I, think about the fact of, of warfare and smallpox. And I have to say, I'm, I, I'm going to beg you to talk a little bit about George Washington here. We don't <laughs> usually do founding fathers in your work or mine, but could you say a little something about George, George Washington and the smallpox epidemic? Yeah, so I learned a lot about George Washington <laughs> doing this research. For one thing, I learned that uh, he had had smallpox uh, when when he was a, a very a young man in, in 1752. He and his older half brother Lawrence took a trip to Barbados, and ironically, the reason for their trip was to alleviate uh, Lawrence's uh, persistent cough and congested lungs, the symptoms of the consumption or tuberculosis that would eventually kill Lawrence. And while they're on Barbados, you know, people thought climate helped the symptoms of, of tuberculosis. Um, so while they're on Barbados, Washington gets sick with smallpox. And he basically disappears for a month. He, he stops writing in his diary. Um, he obviously lived, makes you think about 18th century portraiture, you know, and, and ponder what kinds of scars he might have had that portraitists covered up. But the larger point is that he had hard experience with this disease. And when it threatened to infect and actually did infect his army, he knew how devastating it could be. And eventually, um, when it became clear that it was going to devastate his troops again and again, he waffled back and forth and then eventually. Uh, in the Valley Forge winter of 1777-78, decided to inoculate his troops, uh, which was actually quite a trying procedure. Uh, it's not a vaccination as we think of it today. And, and that, you know, I, I'm not a monocausal kind of uh, historian, but I think it was a very important decision. The war. Well, it, it really seemed like that. Could you, I mean, I hate to be one of these people that love, you know, it's relishing the ugly details, but could you talk a little bit about what, uh, what they called it, variolation, right? You know, yeah. what, did they, what was that process like? Yeah. So they called it inoculation or variolation. And we use inoculation very loosely to refer to any kind of vaccine. Um, but the word variolation comes from the word variola. Smallpox virus was the variola virus, uh, in this case, variola major virus. Um, so variolation was something, was one of these areas in which Europe and Europeans in, generally, uh, in general were kind of behind Asia and Africa. Uh, and there's a wonderful story from Boston in 1716, where the Puritan divine, Cotton Mather who was a he held enslaved African Americans, and he asked one of these Africans, a man named Onesimus, one day. He said, "Onesimus, have you ever had smallpox?" And Onesimus looked at him, and <laughs> Mather wrote this in his diary. Onesimus says, "Yes and no." And then he proceeded to tell Mather about being variolated as a child in West Africa. And what that meant was his father cut an incision in his hand or arm, small incision, and then placed live pustular matter from a smallpox patient into that incision, wrapped it up. Little Onesimus came down with smallpox, a mild case. He survived. And the blessing of having this disease, if you live, is that you have immunity for life. Uh, 
So variolation was a way of conferring lifetime immunity. And that's what Washington put his troops through during the Valley Forge winter. You know, we think the Valley Forge winter was hard because of, you know, bare, no shoes and no food and barefoot in the snow. Uh, but add smallpox, going through a mild case of smallpox to that. Yeah. And you got, you got a pretty rough winter. So he was able to get enough of his army uh, inoculated to where they basically could go into places where the epidemic was raging and uh, still conduct warfare. Uh, but warfare is so, it's both, you know, but it's also one of the forces that spreads the epidemic as you've shown very, very powerfully in the book. Um, and also the trade in, in all kinds of goods, but including enslaved people, was part of the way that this disease spreads. Absolutely. You know, warfare inevitably just to create an army brings people together from diverse geographies, you know, social backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, and immunological backgrounds. And they come together to create an army bringing their microbes with them. So that's one way warfare creates uh, or, or cultivates epidemic disease. War also generates refugees, right? And in the American South, especially, um, refugees, I mean, during the partisan warfare, they, they were white and black, but African-Americans constituted a particularly large set of refugees because the British implemented a, uh, a brilliant strategy where they promised freedom to African-Americans who would fight for the British during the American Revolution or um, you know, work as laborers for the British and to help put down the Patriot Uprising. And African-Americans were, were as vulnerable as other Americans were to this disease. British were less vulnerable. We could talk about that later. Um, and African Americans succumbed to smallpox by the thousands uh, in the and Southern Campaign. Yeah. So between the refugees and the ones who were volunteering for the British, it does seem that you know they were just particularly uh, devastated. I can remember when I was working on my Jefferson book, reading about various people from his neighborhood, friends and family, and some of his own enslaved people uh, who fled to the British lines and and you know, were devastated by, by smallpox in Dunmore's camp and on his ship. So um, just a terrible, terrible story and yeah. something that, you know, that, that survivors come limping back and, and it's just, you know, a story of, of, of massive death. Um, this certainly also is the case as we begin to see warfare spreading um, from these continental sediments um, at both in, in Mexico and from the Russians up in the Northwest and then from the English uh, into the American interior. And you were able to find and document that um, all these multiple different ways that this the epidemic is spreading. Yeah, yeah, I mean, warfare, there is some indigenous warfare in the West that uh, helps to spread the epidemic. Um, you know, one of the things that that the epidemic actually shows is how robust indigenous trade networks were, indigenous communication networks. Um, you know, it, act, it reveals a great deal about the, the connections that linked people, this common experience that was smallpox during, during the, these years. Um, there were also uh, transportation changes that facilitated the spread of the illness in in the West. Um, first and foremost, the full-fledged adoption of equine culture, horse culture by plains people. I mean, it, it's hard for us even to imagine the pedestrian plains versus the equestrian plains, but horses sped up uh, communication, made it easier for people to communicate. Uh, sometimes they're communicating information, um, Sometimes they're communicating microbes, yeah, um, and and you know, it just shows how closely connected the West was to the rest of the continent. So some of those connections are, you know, they seem positive and benign. They're people trading together, they're meeting, they're, um, you know, uh, 
whatever, forming families, whatever it is, but then they, it has this very uh, uh, devastating effect, unintentional. But there's also people who are using uh, what we would call biological germ warfare to try to achieve their ends. And can the, the, obviously the most uh, notorious example of this is Sir Jeffrey Amherst and the, and the infamous smallpox blankets given to native peoples. Um, but there are lots of examples of this that you found. And I, I, I think it's important to, for people to hear about that as well. Well, so just in, in case people are familiar with it, the, the incident that Gingy is referring to took place in 1763 uh, in the aftermath of the Seven Years' War at a place called Fort Pitt, which is the current site of Pittsburgh. And what happened after the Seven Years' War is that the native peoples of the Midwest were not happy with the settlement. And an Odawa leader named Pontiac wrote, uh, you know, organized uh, an uprising. And so a, a band of Lenape natives had besieged Fort Pitt and they asked for parlays. Uh, Parleys were held, and at the end of the parleys, the British officers at Fort Pitt um, knowingly, deliberately gave two blankets and a handkerchief from a smallpox hospital to the natives. And a fur trader on the scene, a man named William Trent, actually wrote in his journal, he said, we hope it will have the desired effect. Um, the famous Jeffrey Amherst was not on the scene. He was commander in chief. And when he learned that, that smallpox had broken out at Fort Pitt, within Fort Pitt, not yet among the natives, he actually wrote to Fort Pitt independently on his own, not knowing that they had already tried this, suggesting that they should do it to extirpate or annihilate um, native people. And we find then during the American Revolution, more accusations of this. One of the things that's inter interesting is that th there were rules of war at this time, but the rules of war did not apply if you were engaged with savages or rebels. And what were the Americans in the revolution? They were rebels. Um, so we have good documentation for British suggestions of implementing germ warfare. We have some documentation indicating that Americans thought the British were implementing germ warfare. There's a vaguely worded episode at the end of the war when you know, the British, they've had 30,000 African-Americans fled to their lines in Virginia. And many of them succumbed to smallpox. And as the British, as Lord Cornwallis is approaching his denouement at, uh, at Yorktown, he actually orders his men to turn their guns on these African-Americans to whom they've promised freedom and force them back to American lines. And one of the officers writes um, something suggestive of germ warfare, but it's not. It's, it's not a, a smoking gun, but there were accusations throughout the Revolutionary War. And then there are other native accusations as well. It's really hard to document, but it's clearly on people's minds in the 18th century. And I think, you know, this is the kind of thing uh, that it, we, now that we have Geneva Conventions and we have these understandings about biological warfare, we tend to see this as something that should be, that is morally repugnant. We look back at this, I think even then it was understood to be morally repugnant, but they thought that was fine for people that they didn't consider um, deserving of the full rights and privileges of humans. So I think it's, it, you know, when we think about, um, about the ways in which we react to a notion of people deliberately infecting people with, with smallpox, it's, it's, it's hard to, Hard to imagine from this. It from is. This I, yeah, I mean, what's what it reveals, and when you read that that Amherst correspondence, especially, is it it reveals genocidal intent. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think you know we that's the kind of thing that we can't um, we can't ignore in our history, and the ways in which that that this has worked again and again. I, in this case, sometimes unwitting and sometimes 
um, deliberate um, time. Uh, there was, to uh, let me mention that there was a, an officer in New York City who was, New York City was the British headquarters during the Revolutionary War, a, a man named Robert Donkin. And he published a little book called Military, Military Something and Remarks. Um, in the middle of the war, published in New York City. And it actually had a footnote in it suggesting germ warfare. It's something to the effect of, why don't we dip, our, dip arrows in, in matter of smallpox and twang them at the American rebels? And, twang them. Twang them, yes. And uh, this book, interestingly enough, um, has the footnote excised, cut out, literally cut out, in all but two surviving copies. So that suggests to me that British High Command did it before the, the book got distributed because they realized uh, you know, just, just how troubling that might be for people to read. So we have a good question here from uh, David Patty, um, who wants to know, why do you feel that epidemics have not become part of our collective historical memory or why they, why they aren't taught? You know, I suspect that's kind of a late 20th century phenomenon. You know, if you grew up when, when we did, I'll use we generally, and if you grew up in the United States um, or in the developed world, you probably didn't have to worry too much about infectious disease until the early 80s. Um, but we've come, we've come through this this heady period in which you know at one point a surgeon general predicted the imminent end of infectious disease itself, and HIV really brought us up short in that regard. And since then, we have dealt with um, we've had to think differently about epidemic disease. But we've we've just we've kind of gotten a pass. And I don't think we really appreciate what it meant. I mean, I know personally when I started doing smallpox research, and I went to the med school library and I pulled these smallpox textbooks off the shelf and I started looking at those pictures. Oh, now I get it. You know, it, it was, it really changed my understanding. You know, but we've had a past. We have had a past right up until just about now. I mean, I, I remember um, as a child being vaccinated for everything that you could be vaccinated for, including, you know, getting to be in the first generation of kids that got vaccinated against polio. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that made a real difference. And we knew people who had had polio as children or who had survived it or who died from it. And so that, you know, that is within my historical lifetime. Um, so I think we're, you know, we're definitely now circling back to a time when we're going to understand that, that this is a part of the human experience. Um, but that also speaks something to, you know, we're historians, we think we're standing still looking at the past, but the past keeps on happening, as we know, history just keeps on happening. So could you talk a little bit about how you've evolved as a, as a historian, how you've changed your approach? over time, not only with Pax Americana, but with um, encounters at the heart of the world and, and maybe a little bit about the project that you're working on now. Yeah, you know, I've evolved to feel much more comfortable with uncertainty. Um, Pax Americana helped me grapple with that some because there were so many gaps in the evidence, you know, that I just had to acknowledge that, that those gaps and speculate. And one of the things that book taught me is that speculating can be really fun. <laughs> yeah. And there are some virtues in running out of evidence because it, it fires up the imagination. Who could have done, what could have done, you know, how could have, you know, it, 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 so I became more comfortable with uncertainty in the course of writing that book. Um, but more recently, in writing the second book, Encounters at the Heart of the World, I came to question really the nature of scholarly authority. You know, this, this third person, omniscient, 
voice of authority that we learn in graduate school. Uh, you know, where we do, we engage in this kind of posturing and positioning vis-a-vis -vis other scholars. I actually did it earlier this evening when I said I wanted to issue a corrective to my field, right? Um, and we do that, you know, we're always like asserting where we stand and why we're right. And we're doing it within this third person, godlike, omniscient voice. And, uh, you know, writing history is hard. Yeah. And all of our work is flawed. We come to our topics for who knows what reasons, you know, by, by serendipity, by advisor coercion, by, you know, good luck, by brilliance, by experience, you know, we, we, and, and we bring all kinds of personal quirks then once we've got a topic to our work. You know, our personal quirks are, you know, I, blind spots. I, Lord knows I got blind spots. You know, blind spots, um, things we're really interested in, things that scare us, things that we are afraid to deal with, you know, topics that we can't even wrap our brains around. So I'd love to see us own that quality dimension of our work and incorporate it into our scholarship. You know, talk about how we started to think this way and then changed our mind, but that other thing might be a possibility. So I just think it would be a much more honest way to proceed with the task at hand. And it opens up scholarship, I think, you know, for, for others to, to follow up on. So one of the ways that you actually do that uh, in encounters with the heart of the world, and to a to a somewhat lesser degree in Pax Americana, is that you're using different voices in different places when you're writing. And I, I guess you know we know that um, as historians we're researchers, but we're also writers. And so you know, talk a little bit about about your your history, your own personal history as a writer, and in the course of of uh, reading all the things you have to read, but also of, of, of figuring out how to write a book. Because I know that. Anybody who's tuned in tonight to listen to us instead of the, you know, St. Louis Cardinal game or the Democratic Convention or whatever else they could be watching, I, they're probably, you know, got an interest in the literary part of this as well. Gosh. Oh, you <laughs> tell me, Gingy. <laughs> you know, I pay attention to writing. Writing really matters to me. And I think Part, part of that comes from reading. I, you know, I like to read um, fiction, good fiction, well-written fiction. I believe that history is not rocket science and that it should be accessible to a, to a broad reading public. And I also believe the public is smart, you know, explains something clearly, explains something well, and uh, people will get it. And, you know, part of that came from, you know, I, I spent eight years working as an auto mechanic. And I learned that like, I, I worked with guys who didn't have high school diplomas, but were way smarter than I am. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and so I learned to respect different kinds of intelligence and to try to, you know, when I envision my audience, I'm envisioning anyone and everyone who's literate, who can actually read this. But it is hard work. You know, I've, I, my writing has evolved. I've, I've now I've pared back all my adverbs and adjectives, you know, my sentences have gotten shorter again, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a process. It is a process. And I think, you know, part of it is just figuring out how to work with those historical documents and sources, and then thinking about, you know, what's your intervention? Who are you and how do you get in there? We have a really interesting question uh, in the Q and A from Joseph Schmidt, who says, uh, I'm a secondary educator. How would you suggest and again, you're integrating your research on this epidemic into a U.S. history survey course. Um, are there particular sources you'd recommend using with high school students particularly? And uh, what strategies would you suggest to use with this history that uh, might kind of complicate the traditional survey uh, uh, of the period? Yeah, um, I think the story of this epidemic itself integrates really nicely with the story of the American Revolution. And it blows it up 
by expanding across the continent. But I think what's, what would hook high school students is to show them those handwritten documents from Fort Pitt in 1763. Because this business of smallpox blankets is out there. And if you get on the internet, you know, people are saying, oh no, it's just a Soviet canard. And you'll, yeah. but it, to have students tease out the words in that correspondence would be a, a fascinating exercise and would open up all kinds of questions you know what's legitimate what's not in warfare after all warfare is about killing people you know it's i think it would be a really productive exercise um, for for secondary school well and and i mean especially secondary school um students right now who are living through this um and and i think part of the kind of shock that we feel living through what we're going through now is that it's not just a pandemic. It is a crisis of racial justice. It is a crisis of political uh, legitimacy. It is, um, a, you know, a crisis of foreign relations, of all these kinds of things. And so, you know, we think about all these overlapping kind of crises. And, and so we have a question from Chris Wilson here, uh, you know, asking, you know, how did people along the East Coast, for example, during the revolution, think about being in this kind of simultaneous moment of an epidemic, a revolutionary war. How did they live, you know, how did they live that moment? I, th I feel like you brought that alive to me, but maybe you could say something for everybody who's, who's tuning in today about that kind of like affective part of this history. Yeah, um, the documents reveal the, the kinds of fear that, is newly familiar to us. Um, soldiers afraid to enlist because they're afraid of contracting smallpox. Um, you know, mothers rescuing children, or, you know, young adolescent boys, men, actually, <laughs> Andrew Jackson uh, contracted smallpox in a British prisoner camp. And his mother rescued him, propped him up on the horse, you know, with smallpox and brought him home. But, you know, you've got to look at the individual documents to tease out people's concerns, people's fears. Now, and you also have to realize that people didn't have the kind of communication networks that we have. So it wasn't this big explosion of fear as we had back in, say, mid-March. Um. <laughs> right. Way back in mid-March. Yeah. Well, and, and, and thinking about fear, you know, and so, you know, communication and amplifying fear and that sort of thing. Um, one of the things I was struck by is the way in which the politics of, of variolation or uh, inoculation had so much to do with fear. And I've thought about that a lot because, you know, many of us are hoping that the vaccine will, will save us. Uh, and yeah. that we can resume some sort of normal life, but we we do have to contend with people who are afraid of vaccination, mm -hmm. who don't want to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And so, can you say a little something about the role of fear in history? Well, I could talk about fear and, and inoculation and vaccination. Certainly, um, you know, inoculation involved getting smallpox. So you had to be able to set aside, if you were a civilian, you had to be able to set aside four weeks of your life to go through this disease. And this meant that inoculation was accessible to the wealthy who could afford the cost and they could afford to set aside four weeks of their lives. Um, it was not accessible to poor and working people. And as a consequence, they often rebelled, you know, rioted when inoculations were undertaken because they were afraid those wealthy inoculees, if they felt well enough, might circulate in the community and communicate smallpox to them. Um, so you do see fear manifest, you know, when it comes to inoculation. Um, and, and, and you can, you can see why people are scared 
today, you know, we're afraid that it's going to be rushed into production. Um, who's it, who's it going to be available to? Is it just right. going to be available to, to NBA players and, or, or to the wealthy? Um, who's going to get it first? These are all, all really important and difficult questions. Yeah, I think about, um, you know, the Annette Gordon-Reed's remarkable, brilliant reconstruction of Sally Hemings' experience getting inoculated in France. The first thing Jefferson did because she, he right. wanted someone to bring his daughter over, who, his daughter uh, Maria, who uh, was actually um, Sally's niece, we now know, yeah. but um, wanted uh, someone, to, an escort to bring her who had been inoculated against smallpox. Sally went, she had not been in Iraq. So her first experience in Europe, in Paris, is to get shoved off to the inoculation camp where she spends four, four weeks all by herself being incredibly sick. Yeah. Um, so I can see the, the terror. Um, we have a question here from Deborah Harkness to all of us. So uh, Deborah wants to know, how can I help my students read the gaps in these sort of records in a critical and active way? Um, she's, you know, Deborah says she's really impressed by your uh, little scholarship and by students and other historians. Um, but, you know, she says she can be really strict on this issue. And, and uh, so if we only rely on white male voices of privilege, we lose so much. She wants your advice, Lil. Yeah. Um, she's fascinated by the Cotton Mather story, for instance, and says thanks for an amazing conversation. Oh, well, thank you so much. And you never know, <laughs> speaking of writers, because Cotton Mather could show up in something that Deborah is writing any time. So <laughs> be careful what you wish for here when you speak. Yeah. So I like to do an exercise with my student where I act, students where I have them actually think about what it's like to be, to receive a document. You know, so I, I, when I taught at Duke, I had access to the Nathaniel Green papers. and you know, I would take a photocopy of one of his letters and fold it up and say, okay, here, you know, imagine now that you're in another camp and you've just received this letter, right? Who would have delivered? It? How would you have received? It? You know, think about what it's like to open it up, to read the contents. Are you reading it at night in your tent? Is it during the day? Are you on horseback? Whatever, you know, you put it in your pocket. What does the letter say to you? What does it say to you the second time you read it? What does, who wrote it? What, for what purpose did they write it? You know, uh, what are they not saying? Where are they writing from? Why are they writing? Just part, just, just you know, rip into it and close reading and then closer reading and really try to tease out what's not said and then what questions the letter raises. And I think you can do that with every document. I like to have my college students write papers based on just one document. Yeah. Um, yeah. And or, you know, or or the moment where you get a document that says, why didn't you write me a letter, which is what the one that really struck me, the the Hudson Bay Post con commander who uh, should have gotten word from another from another uh, trader, you know, about an outbreak that had happened in that post. So, I mean, your reading of documents is absolutely superb. Um, I see some more questions here and I'm gonna try and fit them in while we have time. So this is from William Fleck. On the West Coast, what sources do you share regarding what is now California, Oregon, and Washington? Yeah, um, so the best records, I, it is not clear to me that smallpox extended far into the Alta California. Um, the sources for Baja California are really interesting. Believe it or not, uh, since, um, since this is a, an Autry event, um, smallpox reached Alta California by way of Baja California, uh, and it was carried by this, the uh, party that established Los Angeles. Um, they carried smallpox to San Gabriel Mission, and it spread to the Indians of Baja and um, the Indians in, at San Gabriel. The rest of 
Alta California is a blank. We don't know if smallpox affected those populations or not. Um, in fact, I should point something out about my map, if you don't mind. There are all these gaps on it. Um, there's a gap in Alta California. There's a big gap in the Midwest. Uh, and the, that reflects absence of evidence. It doesn't necessarily reflect absence of smallpox. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, the evidence, as you see, you know, for you see the mark, uh, I have marked the Dolls, which is a huge Native American trading center. Um, much of that evidence is from Lewis and Clark, who passed through this region you know, a, a generation after the epidemic, and then from the many vessels engaged in the sea otter trade on the northwest coast um, of, of the continent. They all came, they all arrived and recorded smallpox after the fact which was to say that they reported scars among the natives that they encountered. And they, and they also reported just empty village after empty village after empty village. So that's one of those cases. It gets back to the earlier question. Have you got to read the, the gaps in the record? You know, what do these empty villages mean? Empty villages or villages where they come on people that were you know, just horribly sick um, and, you know, just trying to figure out what do you do about that, people running away from the people that are sick or somebody else um, being willing to take care of them. And we have a question from Maddie Tarmina, who says, who took care of the men when they all got the pox uh, en masse under Washington? It seems that labor is, you know, something that needs to be in the story. So one of the positive things about smallpox is that it does confer immunity. So epidemics tended to happen at intervals of like 15 years or more. And what this meant was that it provided you weren't experiencing a so-called virgin soil epidemic where there had never been an epidemic of that particular disease. Usually there were people in a population who had some kind of acquired immunity. And that allowed them to circulate, take care of others. But that wasn't always the case. You know, and, and you know, you've hit on a, a really important problem. You know, what do you do? What do you do when you, your mother contracts coronavirus? Right? And you're the one at home to nurse her. Right? The, and, and coronavirus, you know, ain't nothing compared to smallpox with a 38% or, or higher or lower, you know, case fatality rate. Um, and so that's a, that's a really important question and, a, and a, a, a real challenge. And it was especially a challenge in those first epidemics, probably in the 16th century. We have accounts of uh, you know, people saying, or even among the pilgrims in the, in the 17th century, there was a smallpox epidemic in 1634 and William Bradford writes about you know, they were all so sick that nobody could even carry water. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Um, you know, I I wish we could talk all night about this. Uh, we're coming to the we're coming to the end of our time together here. Um, and I, I guess I just have one more question for you. I will take the liberty of the last question. What do you wish people would ask about this work? I mean, uh, if you if I had if, missed anything or if there's something that you'd really like people to know, what what would that be? That there's more work to be done. <laughs> um, I, I, I wish people asked me where to go next with it. You know, I'd love to see scholars dig into social and cultural dimensions of this epidemic that I was unable to, to unearth either because of my own blinders or because I, I couldn't find the evidence. I would love to have, um, a native rendition of Pax Americana. I would love for scholars to write the South American version. You know, there, this book has a mirror image in South America and that's a, you know, this was my, my PhD dissertation and that's a dissertation yet to be, to be written. And I, and I wish someone would 
more explicitly probe the fault lines that uh, the smallpox of 1775 and 82 revealed. Because that, I think, is what, that's what epidemics do. They show people at their best, they show people at, at, at their worst, and they show the fault lines of society. I mean, we're, we, are, we are living through that right now. Well, it's very powerfully clear from Pax Americana and from the rest of your work that um, that history has a kind of urgency of now that I think um, even if we um, were not living through this pandemic, I think would be obvious to anybody who has read your work or who's been able to listen to you tonight. Uh, I really want to thank you for a stunning conversation and uh, really looking forward to the next chapter of your work. Uh, ben, uh, shall, can I bring it back to you? Um, please, if you are, if those of you who are out there listening to this, if you want to get on and, and let us know what you think about this, we will have a rec recording of this available on the, on the Autry Museum website. And we look forward to hearing from you and welcoming you back. And um, Elizabeth Fenn, thank you so much. We, it's a privilege to have you as oh, our thank you. scholar this year. Thank you. It's it's such an honor, such an honor to speak with you, such an honor to have, have this wonderful audience and to be a part of the Autry. Thank you, Ben. All thank right. you both. Thank you, Gingy. Thank you, Lil. And Gingy, you said it better than I ever could for all of this. So thank you. Gingy, you were wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, and, and good night.